Hey everybody, welcome to my YouTube. This is the first among a long series of make with me sessions that I've been wanting to do for a long time, but have never had the time. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna do like a cute intro like this where I talk to you in person and you get to see um, what we're gonna be making. So today we're gonna be making something kind of similar to this, not this, this is my, um, what did I call it? Fresh Prints with a Z, print as in P-R-I-N-T-Z, Fresh Prints um, collection. And I wanted to share something similar to this um, in a make with me style video. So that's what we're gonna do. And the really cool thing is if you are a patron of mine, you're gonna get this video first before anybody else sees it on YouTube. So that's kind of fun. I will be releasing it on my Patreon probably like a week before I release it on my YouTube. So that gives you lots of time to play with the techniques and, um, you know, get onto it before anybody else does. I don't know. Um, I kind of just thought it would be a fun way. So if you're interested in my Patreon, check it out. I'll put the links below. But yeah, let's make something together. Uh, this week is bright colors and pattern clashing. So let's do it. Guess who's back? It's me. Welcome to my new studio space, or shall I say the made over studio space. Um, I am going to do a detailed in-depth tour of my studio in another video but yeah I'm kind of excited my husband is super talented and he is the one that built all of that custom made um also can we just have a moment what is in that drink <laughs> it's mountain dew all right I need to have a sugar fix when I'm making um it keeps me fresh and buzzing and ready to create now this beautiful wall of color is what inspires me and helps me choose what I'm going to make with. In front of me, as you know, in the intro, we've talked about what we're going to make today and it's all about bright colors. Now, I'm keeping it super simple today. We are using a variety of different brands, but also just straight from the packet with a couple of them. We are going to make two pastel colors, but for now, we're going to use Cernit Metallic, which is the new white metallic, and Souffle Igloo for the base. Primo Mustard, Fimo Professional Lemon, oh, one of my favorite colors. We are also using Cornflower Blue, Purple Pearl, and Shamrock Green, as well as Magenta Metallic from Cernit and Poppy Seed Black. So that's exciting! Okay, so while I'm doing fancy stuff here, like opening the packet and getting the clay out and lining it up, I thought I'd talk about why I like to use a little bit of Cernit in my base when I'm using Igloo. I have personally just found Igloo to be um, an amazing formula, but I want the added strength and I want the different texture and feeling you get from adding Cernit. Um... You'll know when you try it. So what I do is I always do a 50-50 mix of white igloo or white primo with a cernet white or translucent. And honestly, it's just the best. It really is. Uh, it's a little bit more fiddly to work with. And this, yeah. <laughs> when you see me put it through Janice, which is my Lucy Clay tool um, clay machine, I skipped a few bits out because it was a bit crumbly and I probably needed to spend a bit more time getting it nice and soft. I don't like to put my clay through cold. I like to just get it a little bit soft and not cold, but you know what I mean. Um, I like to just soften it a bit with my roller first and then I chuck it through. I'm going to do a lot of stuff by hand in this video that I could possibly have done with a clay machine. Um, but yeah, that's just what we're going to do. So... I'm adding, what is this? What am I doing here? What am I doing? I'm opening, oh, right. So <laughs> we're going to make a pastel color right now. And I am just using one part igloo to, I think I'm going to use about a quarter of that. Okay, no. So it's one to a half. Do I even know? You saw what I was doing. One part, no. 
Okay. <laughs> Let's make it one part purple pearl to two parts igloo. There you go. That makes sense. Gosh, color mixing is a... And look at that. Thank you. Um... So I just, I knew I wanted to put some pastel colors in this as well, and you're going to see why. It just helps with contrast. It's really, really important to have some type of contrast in there. Now, I also know that I'm going to be laying black over top of this, so I really want the colors to be popping, which means they're just going to jump out and just look amazing. Um, a couple of things when I was doing conditioning here. Now, the green and the blue were nice and soft. The Fimo Lemon, my gosh, that stuff is difficult to condition. I don't even care what anyone says, Fimo is difficult to condition. I needed to add clay softener, there was a whole lot of colour transferring, it was just a whole deal. However, I love the colour so much, it's totally worth it. It's kind of like an acid yellow fluoro-y green type color and it's just so beautiful but it takes work it takes so much damn work all right <sighs> right so we've got all our colors now what I'm gonna do is I like to oh right we're making another color okay <laughs> okay guys we're only like a tenth of the way into this video and I'm already like I don't know what I'm doing um so here we're going to you I don't know why I did this. Look at what I'm doing with my hands. What am I actually doing? So, again, it's the same ratio. So, the ratio that I use for pastels is um, one part of the color to two parts, usually, of the lighter color, so the white. How perfect is that peach? There's no better peach than a mandarin peach. Oh, Okay, okay, let's just move on. All right, so our large depth guides, these are the pro length, which means that they are 29.5 centimeters in length. Um, you know all about my tools. I don't need to go on about it. I don't want to go on about it in my videos. So yeah, although my new stainless steel rollers, I'll definitely go on about those. I have those available on my website. I absolutely love them because it is not an acrylic roller. They are nice and cold to touch. They do get a little bit sticky. You just have to give them a wipe every now and then, but that's more to do with the different brand of clay that you're using, if I'm honest with you. Um, but what I am doing is getting my base ready. So what I do is I, when I put it through my clay machine, my clay machine is set up to be at three mil. So I fold it in half. I then roll it out with my large guides, just like you see me doing here. And then I like to trim the edges as well, which kind of helps me avoid having any folded edges on the backs. And you can see that at the top there on the right, I can see that it's still got a folded edge. So I just cut it off. And those pieces of white will be used again. So always keep your white separate from all your other scrap clay because ain't nobody want dirty white. Dirty, dirty white clay. <laughs> Okay, this is my favorite baking paper. It's available in Australia. I'm not sure what you have in America or Canada um, or around the world, but I love that one because it is better for the environment. And, you know, we're working with a product where we really have to be mindful. And that's one of the biggest things that you're going to find not only on my YouTube, but also on my Patreon. So what I like to do when I'm working on a slab is pop it on a piece of baking paper. Um, you guys can use parchment paper, I think. Uh, but the reason why I like baking paper is it doesn't leach out the oils in the clay. If you use normal copy paper or just like, you know, paper that you put in your photocopier, it will start to leach the oils of the clay for the longer time that it sits on it. So I don't recommend that because it actually weakens your clay. Oh my gosh, how... I can't even get over how beautiful this magenta is. So what I'm doing is rolling it ultra thin, like thinner than my small guide, like my extra small guides, which are 1.1 mil, 1.5 mil. Yeah, so rolling it paper thin. Now, this would obviously be much faster and much easier with a small clay machine, just chucking it down to the thinnest setting and getting a really thin piece of clay. However, I have got a large industrial size clay machine, which takes me changing two dials to change it down and it's just yeah 
I just can't be bothered. It's easier for me to use my roller for small pieces like this when I'm not doing, um, you know, a lot. So yeah, anyway, all I am doing is what I like to call a rip and tear technique, which is ripping a thin piece of clay and laying it on almost like a terrazzo style, but this is going to turn into, it's going to be a lot more than a terrazzo. A terrazzo is more spaced out and usually the sizes are kind of similar and yeah, it's just, yeah. So it goes beyond a terrazzo, but you'll see as we go along how I build the colors. So there's no real reason for me to start with the magenta. I just really liked it and I kind of, and that's how thin it is. See how thin it is? Um, so I kind of just, I don't know, I started with a pink because whatever. <laughs> There's no real rhyme or reason. I don't have a special process that I use for this type of thing. But one thing I do, and I will talk about it when we get to it, is that I do keep adding and keep sort of tweaking as we go along in the process. But I'm about to just place some colors on. So unless I really need to tell you what I'm doing, although funny thing, don't know why I put the tiny, tiny pieces of pink on because I cover them all. <laughs> um, so there was really no point in that. So yeah, but these colors all just sort of work together. I don't know what it is. Um, there wasn't anything specific that drew me to the colors. I knew I wanted them to be bright. I knew that I wanted them to be vibrant and I also knew I wanted to have a, just a couple of pastels in there and also a sort of earthy tone, which is the mustard by Primo. This is my first time using the mustard. I have to say it was just reminded me of a normal Primo um, formula in terms of conditioning it. So that was quite good. It didn't seem like it was any harder than any other one. The color is very similar to Ochre by Fimo, uh, which is a super popular mustard color. I actually prefer more of a greeny mustard or like a cool toned mustard, which I've always liked. Uh, but it's still really, really good. And I'm so glad they finally brought a mustard out. Oh, yeah. So Fimo is known for being quite sticky. And it's, yeah, this, I used a lot of clay softener in that. So it's just ultra sticky. So I decided instead of using my roller, just to use my hands and to just squeeze it. Squeeze it? <laughs> okay. Sounds like a, anyway. Um, just to make it nice and thin. Because if that Fimo being sort of like a little bit harder went on, it would, it just wouldn't amalgamate into the slab. So you do have to be really careful that all your clay is really well conditioned before you put it onto a slab like this, because there's a lot of layering. Now, one of the things that I find frustrating when I watch people make slabs is that people are using three mil depth guides um, and then just rolling down on a three mil depth guide. So like getting their base to three mil and then rolling again from three mil. Whereas you should be starting out with like a, a 4.5 mil depth on your um, slabs and then rolling it down carefully. You're gonna see my roll down process in this, which I don't think I've really shared that often. Now, this is a moment where I wanted to chat to you. So you can see I've placed all the color. What I'm doing now is going through with the blue and just adding it to places where I feel like it's missing. And one of the things that I do is I do that little squinting technique with my eyes, kind of like you do with that magic book that you used to be able to do the 3D, like, anyway, so that's what I do. And what, <laughs> I sort of squint at my slab so that I can get a blurred look at the actual colors on there and see where the contrast is missing or where the darker tones are missing or where there's gaps or where there's like too much white and not enough color. So yeah, I just really think about it. I move my slab around a lot, turn it around, look at it from different angles um, and just add color where I think it needs to be added. And you can see as we're going through this process, how much depth gets added to the slab. So, I mean, all right, clean, clean, clean. Another thing that I do, which you guys are going to hear me go on and on about because it's just something I'm, I'm really strong on, is working clean. Making sure your desk is clean, making sure you wipe your hands, making sure you just work clean and you just avoid so much um, color transfer. Now, I have got my large guides again. So this is the base depth that we made. I've also got my larger roller because I know I'm going to need extra room to roll with. And what I'm doing is just getting that layer down 
so that I can again see what's missing and what I need to add. So again, we're staying at the 4.5 mil depth and the ultimate depth for my slabs is three mil because I'm not coating with resin. What am I doing there? Why am I okay? Feel like I'm missing some peach. If you can see that, I can see that too. Watching it back is so interesting, guys, when I do the voiceover and I'm like, oh, it's giving me a little bit of anxiety watching, <laughs> watching myself miss things. But anyway, I mean, how much are we loving the lighting setup? I'm not going to lie. I'm so proud of it. I did part of this video at nighttime too. And yeah, guys, Grant has hooked me up with the LEDs. Yeah, definitely needed a bit more blue. So the reason why I just rolled down to the 4.5 mil or the large guy depth is because I don't want to go too far to the point where I can't keep adding. So I knew that I wanted to just add a bit more depth in with the color and the contrast. So that's why I only rolled to 4.5. Once I'm happy with it to go down a little bit further, I will. But because we're going to be laying on the top some black detailing we will be staying at 4.5 for a while so i'll let you just enjoy this Okay, so we're just giving it the final roll down. I'm pretty happy with how the colors are placed and the contrast and how it all looks now. So I'm just going to pop it on a little piece of baking paper. It's off center, so I'm going to need to center it. Yep, sort it out. Then what we're going to do is, oh, a little bit of shopping network show you the guides oh there's my extruder now this is a basic extruder that you can use for working with clay and they are easy to get you can get them from blackbird and violet who is a aussie supplier or you can get them from amazon or i'm pretty sure you'll be able to pick one up from a craft store close to you it's really easy all you do is pop the clay in the end Grab one of the little discs and all the discs have different punch outs of different shapes and sizes that you can um, extrude the clay. So I've chosen the smallest, um, the smallest circles. So there's a bunch of them kind of like spaghetti. It's like angel hair. It's so thin. I would say they are maybe like one mil or 1.5 mil uh, in diameter the little holes and this is the one that I use for this technique because they are nice and small then I just add the top on and we're good to go now if you are doing or planning to do a lot of extruded work so you want to make hoops you want to make canes you want that you know beautiful extruded shape then I do recommend you look at investing into a Lucy Clay tool. Uh, she has an amazing um, extruder that allows you to attach a drill, which means you don't even need to wind it and you can do bigger amounts. It's a lot, it holds a lot more clay than this does. Now, as you can see, they come out like little spaghetti uh, and I'm just going to extrude that whole amount of clay, which kind of gives me, mm, I don't know, maybe like 15 centimeters in length, not even that, maybe even just 10 centimeters in length. It's the same sort of length as the slab that I'm working on at the moment. So yeah, I think that's probably about 10 centimeters. Um, and you just have to be really gentle. Now, can I just tell you guys, the sound of this is so squeaky. Ugh. You're lucky this is a voiceover and you don't have to hear it. <laughs> so what I do is I just lay that down really gently and I'm going to use that in a minute to lay down on the top of my slab. But what I want to do with my slab before I um, add any black detailing onto it is just actually make it a little bit thinner. And the reason for that is that if I am to place this black detailing on top of a 4.5 mil slab, then 
the black is actually just going to spread out too much. Now, what I want to do is take it down to about four mil, not quite the final depth of three mil, but just in between the 4.5 and the three. So I'm going to roll it again to get it slightly thinner so that when I roll that final depth of three mil, the black doesn't spread too much. I hope that makes sense. It makes sense in my mind. I know what I'm doing. So anyway, I grab my three mil depth guides and I just pop them down beside my slab so that I just, I don't go too far. It's kind of like a safety net, if you know what I mean. I don't really like to roll too much without my guides. I just, I feel like I'm a little bit, I'm, I'm a little bit attached to them, if you know what I mean. Like I just like to work with them. It just makes everything so much easier. So yeah, I'm just taking that down. I reckon it's going to be like, it's 3.5 to 4 mil thick now. Um, and that's perfect for what I need. Now, another thing that you could do, which I think I'll chat about now, is you could possibly, if you really wanted to, you could roll the slab down to the 3 mil now. And you could add this black detailing exactly how I'm going to do it and leave it as raised detailing, which to be honest would look amazing. It wasn't the look that I was going for with this, so that's why I didn't do it, but you could totally do that. So you would just have to have that slab at the final depth of three mil so that the raised detailing wasn't adding too much, um, you know, too much depth or too much thickness to your slab. But because I want everything to be super flat, that is why I have done exactly what I've done in this video. Now, this took literally two hours to get this on the slab, like exactly what I'm doing. And all I am doing is really gently holding that black strand of clay without squeezing it, without pulling it. Oh, <laughs> this is going rogue. Um... And that is what is helping me just place it. And so what I do is I move the actual strand of clay. And then once I'm happy with the position, I press it down lightly onto the clay, knowing that I'm obviously going to eventually roll over top of it anyway. So that's what helps it stick. And then I'm able to just keep maneuvering it around the slab. And I think for me, it was easier to use a longer strand than it was to cut little pieces and, and do little pieces. Now, obviously, there are other ways that you could add um, this black detailing or this finish onto the slab. You could choose to use a silk screen. Um, if you haven't heard of silk screens, we'll definitely be getting into that uh, in my Patreon and on my YouTube. But Silk screens are an amazing, amazing tool for adding detail simply with acrylic paint, which I, I think looks great. And I will definitely do some in future. Um, Moiko is the silk screens that I really love. And a couple of the suppliers here in Australia, Blackbird and Violet and Jewelry Supplies Co., both have custom drawn or have drawn their own silk screens. You can get custom silk screens from her as well. So she does do that where you could draw this pattern out digitally and send it to her and then get her to do it. Do you know what I mean? So if you want to avoid the two hours that you have to do to place the clay on, you could do a silk screen. The only thing is, is if you're going to do a silk screen, there's other things to think about. So it's not just putting the you know, putting the acrylic paint on using the silk screen, which is basically just screen printing onto polymer clay. You have to then, you need to seal it. So you need to seal the paint. You need to double bake it, which means you're putting it on while it's raw. You're going to then cut your shapes out, which can make it really fiddly. Then you're going to cure your clay and then you're going to go back and then you're going to, um, what am I talking about? You don't have to cure this twice. Mm, do you? No, you don't. Sorry, you're not going to cure it twice. You're going to have to then varnish it is what I was going to say. Um, sorry, I was thinking of Posca pens. That was the next thing I was going to talk about. So with this, you need to make sure that you, yeah, so you seal it after you cure it. And that 
can just be a little bit time consuming, right? The other option is pretty much similar, um, but you would use a, say, an acrylic um, pen or a Posca pen, or there's another brand called Iron Lac. So they're basically acrylic paint pens. And what you could do is you could hand draw this design or any sort of detailing you wanted onto the slab, but you would need to do that after you cured. So you wouldn't do it before you cured. You would make the slab, cut out the components, cure the components, come back, use your acrylic pen, illustrate onto it, put it back in the oven for another 20 minutes to cure the paint, and then you would need to varnish. So although it may seem easier at the time to do a silk screen or to use acrylic paint pens for detailing on top, sometimes the time it takes to do detailing like this I don't have to seal this. I don't have to rebake it. It's done and dusted. So, oh, how good is this? Mesmerizing. Anyway, there are other options out there for adding detail, but I just wanted to share that this is the why this is why I like doing it the way I do because I don't have to do anything afterwards. So now this beautiful babe is ready to be rolled down to her final depth. Now, as I said earlier, if you had rolled the slab down to three mil before you applied the black detailing, then you could have kept it raised like it, as you could see in the close up. Uh, however, my plan was always to roll it down. So this is how I do it. I use my small depth guides and my longer length um, roller. And I very gently, like there is, I'm not actually adding very much pressure at all. I'm not pressing down hard. I am literally just rolling over it and I take it very slowly. It takes me a lot of time to do a roll down on a slab like this, especially with this amount of detail. So I'll usually do two or three really light rolls. Like I said, I am not pressing down with a lot of pressure. I'll pick it up very gently by just putting my fingers under the edge of it and just rolling it up and then I will roll it again. Now I move it around so that the pattern stays pretty pretty true to its original pattern um, in the roll down process. Now if you were just to go and throw that through a clay machine all of that beautiful work that you've just done with that detailed pattern would be ruined. It would all be spread to just one side. And also, uh, if you are rolling uh, using depth guides and only going one way, you're pretty much doing the same as what you would do if you put it through a clay machine. It is so important and a part of the process for you to pick it up and move it around. Now, if you feel more comfortable rolling it on baking paper, you can totally do that. I just find if you use clays like Cerner and Fimo that it will tend to stick to the baking paper if you're not moving it off it, um, which does not end well. It does not end well. So for me, the easiest way is just to lightly pick it up and roll it. Now, don't get me wrong. Depth guides aren't a necessity for a slab but they definitely make the job a lot easier and honestly I do still use my clay machine to put through a slab if it's like a marble or a um, plain color where it's got no pattern I will obviously use my clay machine but when I'm doing detailed slabs like this that have pattern confetti pattern like the next one that we're about to do then I 100% prefer to roll down manually like this using guides um, the pro length guides are amazing when we're making slabs this size which this is a normal size slab for me um, there are some of my friends make bigger slabs than this I probably stick around this size usually and then once I have rolled it all down and I'm ready, what I normally do is we'll just put it on some baking paper to let it sit for a bit and we're good as gold. Although this is taking a long time. I'm just going to speed this up. <laughs> Okay. 
Okay, this beautiful, bright popping slab is ready to go. I lay it on some baking paper just to put it aside. Now you can actually leave slabs for as long as you like before you cut them out. And I highly recommend if it is a cernet base uh, that you let it rest or cool for at least half an hour before you start cutting from it. It just makes it a lot easier. It gives a chance for the clay just to sit there and um, rest for a little bit. But yeah, I now just put it aside ready to go. And we are going to then focus on one of my favorite slabs to make and that is just a black and white confetti slab is what I like to call it kind of or you might like to call it a sprinkle slab because it just has that effect and it really works well with a super busy pattern like the one that we've just made so I am just using poppy seed by souffle for my base uh, you can use, and I highly recommend, a Primo Black and Souffle Poppy Seed mix if you like. I just didn't happen to have any um, Primo Black, so I'm using Souffle Poppy Seed, which, let's be honest, these days, they're just, Souffle is like gold in the clay world. So, all I'm doing is getting it nice and soft. Now, you don't have to overwork the souffle poppy seed. It's pretty soft already. So I'm probably just going to um, roll this down by hand, actually. I don't even think I put it through the machine. And honestly, sometimes that helps avoid air bubbles. Or you can get some brands of clay where that actually makes more air bubbles. And putting it through the clay machine helps eliminate some. So as you can see, I haven't folded it or done anything with it. Um, and when I roll it down, you still get air bubbles. And we have been noticing a little bit more lately that um, some of the brands of clay, uh, I'm not going to say any particular brands, but some brands of clay do have air bubbles already trapped inside. And you just have to take a lot of care. Now, air bubbles are the most frustrating thing for a polymer clay maker. They actually drive us nuts. But I'm going to be teaching ways to avoid it in the beginning, which is through this process, but also how to get rid of them after you've cured. Um, and there's a couple of ways. So we'll talk about those throughout my, um, throughout all my videos. So yeah, I'm just literally going to roll it down using my roller. I mean, where did I go? what's happening oh do you know what I've done so the roller that I've been using has got a big dent in it and it's been really annoying it's a second so it got damaged in shipping and I was like you know what I'll just use that and it's just been annoying me lately so I just got a new roller <laughs> that is exactly what I was doing <laughs> I think that I was going to cut it out but I can't be bothered you know this is real I'm authentic you're seeing it all here um, so yeah, I didn't feel the need to put this through the clay machine. Now, when I see an air bubble like that, I usually just get my knife, slice it, and then heal it again. So that means just slicing and then just pressing the air out. And because we're at 4.5 mil, you've got to remember that we're going down to 3 mil, so we've got time to work. I can see another big air bubble, and I'm just sort of pressing the air out. It didn't work, so I'm going to have to get my knife on it. But when it's sort of a big slab like this, you can probably, if you wanted to, you could slice that piece off. Um, I'm obviously going to try and work it out now, but you could slice that piece off and not use it. Another thing you can do, if you've got an ear bubble in the middle of a slab, sorry, I mean, I'm just, in the middle of a slab, you can actually just work around it and then cut it out. Or yeah, there's just lots of ways. You don't have to waste clay because it's got an ear bubble. Um, that's obviously going to be the back because I can see some color transfer from the white. That's annoying, isn't it? Anyway, I'm just rolling it out. And what you're going to see now is we're going to grab the white that we had left over from when I trimmed down that slab before. And that is what we're going to use to do our sprinkle pattern. And the cool thing is, is there's a few ways for you to do a sprinkle pattern. The first way is the way that I'm going to show you, obviously. 
um, which is where I slice it off a piece of clay. So like a little rectangle piece of thin sliced clay, I slice off little sprinkles. The other way is to use the extruder, probably using the exact same um, attachment disc that we used to do the um, black detailing on the other slab and you can slice off there. The only thing I find when I do a confetti pattern from a round, like from a coil or from a snake, I just find that it sort of squishes down, not quite sharp enough for me to look like a confetti pattern. Cleaning her hands again. Obsessed. We have to do it. It's the way of the world right now. But also, no one needs color transfer onto white. Um... <laughs> The good thing about this is the clay that I sliced off, I don't need to recondition it. So I also don't need to overwork the white. Um, it would be the same if you put it through the extruder. You can just push it into the extruder without having to overwork it in your hands, which just means you don't, you don't end up with too much sort of black color transfer and stuff like that. So see how that is. That is 4.5 mil thick. Oh, and here I'm telling you, you could put it in the extruder and use that. <laughs> <laughs> I love my thought process when I'm making these videos. So this is literally just that slice from the slab. All I'm going to do is thinly slice it. Like I'm just going to get myself some slices. Yes. And obviously they're all 4.5 mil in um, width, which is going to be the width of the actual sprinkles. And I'm just going to cut a ton of these little strips out. And we're going to use those to make the confetti. I hope this is an enjoyable video for you guys. I feel like it's a long sort of talky one. And um, yeah, I'm going to work on it being a little bit more short and sharp and things like that. But the important thing for me is that you get the detail and you get to see the entire process instead of like, oh, here, I put these colors on a slab, bang, and it's already done. I wanted you to actually see me working through the process of laying the colors out, you know, slicing off all the little slices for the confetti and then, you know, placing it on the slab. So the key thing with the confetti is to just cut the little slices evenly and just place them randomly. Um, try not to do them too close together, but not too far apart. You can do them bigger, smaller, thinner, whatever you like. Um, I just really like this way of doing it because I feel like it has a sharper finish. You get more of the rectangle shape rather than sort of a rounded looking edge if you use extruded um, extruded clay. So of course the other thing you can do is a silk screen or you could paint pen on, like you can use a Posca pen and do a confetti pattern. But again, we're talking about those things you have to do afterwards, which is, um, you know, curing the paint and varnishing or resining, you know, using a resin coating or something like that. Um, again, I'm doing very similar to what I did with the other slab and just taking that down like a slight notch. So this has gone down to like four mil so that I'm not having to roll it out too much once I have that confetti pattern on. I'm pretty good at that. So I kind of know where I want my slab to be. But if you're not sure, just put your guides beside you like I did initially. Again, chuck it on a piece of baking paper so you can move it around especially when you're applying the sprinkle pattern or confetti pattern. I can't decide what I want to call it. But anyway, you're going to see exactly how I'm getting in nice and close for you. Exactly how I place my pattern. And it is literally just, I didn't even realize you can't see me slicing it off the way. Oh, there we go. Gosh, I'm thinking ahead here. Okay, so all we do is just slice that little rounded end off, clean our knife, get it ready to go and cue probably about an hour and a half's worth of placing white tiny little patterns. Obviously, for all of our sakes and for my sanity, we are about to speed this up so that you do not have to sit here and watch me do this over an abnormal amount of time. But can I say, as much as you could use a silk screen, Posca pens, what have you, this is the most effective look for a sprinkle pattern. I absolutely adore it and I do it a lot in my work. So yeah, it's just the way that I found looks the best. It looks crisp and clean and it's kind of cathartic, just relaxing, placing them on. So 
And the reason why we have it on the baking paper is so you can easily move it around. Um, and it's really good to move the slab quite often while you're placing confetti or sprinkles. Oh, I need to make up my mind. It's sprinkles. So while you're placing the sprinkle pattern, you really need to move it around so that the pattern doesn't accidentally keep going one way. So enjoy watching me place like thousands of little white strips to this clay. And just like that, it's done. Easily four hours worth of work in both slabs combined, I would say. Definitely two hours for the colored slab and easily an hour minimum for the sprinkle slab. But look how good they are look oh my gosh I love it so rolling down the sprinkle slab you just have to be really careful over that first roll that none of the um, little pieces um, attach themselves to the roller and yeah it's pretty much exactly the same roll down it's pick it up move it pick it up move it and just roll really gently so that you don't stretch too much of that pattern um, but oh, how effective does it look? It's going to be so fun to cut out. So we are going to cut the colorful slab first, and then we're going to cut the confetti slab. But you're going to see me cut both slabs up and lay them out. And then in the second part of the video, oh, I'm also just going to use my icicle to wipe the surface. Um, I just love using that stuff. I have is one of my like literally couldn't live without products in my studio which is just rubbing alcohol uh, I never use acetone in my studio um, it's one thing I struggle to see acetone is so harsh on clay I just don't use it for any reason so but really and honestly it's completely up to you as a maker what products you decide to use I'm just sharing with you in my videos my preferences so absolutely take it with a grain of salt now what we're going to do is cut these little puppies up and here are the shape cutters that I'm think that I might use that I'm going to clean and get ready. Um, it's a selection of cutters from different brands. So we've got Outline Cutters, Blackbird and Violet, Arc and Curve, Clay Metal Studio, Clay Time Tools, and yeah. But here's a little treat for you that I thought of and I just think you might enjoy. Oh, I'm just using a needle tool to clean that. <laughs> you can also just um, run it under some water and use an old toothbrush to clean it you know for those really finicky shapes but honestly if you like a little bit of asmr here is my bowl of shape cutters for you um <laughs> i purposely paused it and paused my music so that you could just listen to the like to the clay cutters moving around in the basket so i hope you enjoy it <laughs> I mean, look, it's not for everybody, but <laughs> it was just that I happened to be holding them and I did it. Anyway, so what I was going to show you is just sometimes I'll sit with my cutters like this and I will just, you know, decide on what kind of shapes I want to do, component, combinations, all of that sort of thing. Um, I kind of know what I want to do because I have some faves that I'm working with at the moment. I'm really enjoying organic shapes. Um... Obviously, my moth drops, which are kind of popular in my restocks. So, yeah, this is what I normally do. I'll just sit down and, like, go through the shapes and decide on what I kind of want to use. You can also draw out your shapes. Um, it's definitely a mindful uh, way to make. But, 
Oh, I also thought I would use this amazing set from Blackbird and Violet of metal cutters. And I use these to do cutouts. So like if I want a hoop style component or I just want a cutout, I use these because they are super, super sharp and they leave a really nice finish, which means I don't have to do as much sanding. Know what I mean? You'll see me do it. But yeah, the only thing is getting them back in the container. It's like a puzzle in itself, honestly. But yeah, so I'm definitely going to use that to do a cutout um, in one of these floral cutters from Outline Cutters, which I kind of adore right now. But yeah, these are some of my favorite shapes at the moment. Uh, it changes all the time, so don't get too used to seeing them. I'm also keen to try out some new shapes from different um, make... Okay, jazz hands. Um, all right, well... Let's cut this puppy. I, oh, that sounded a bit savage, didn't it? Sorry. Um, you know, I'm referring to the slab, of course. So a couple of things that are going to be really different to what you normally see on Instagram and probably on YouTube. Um, I like to cut onto baking paper, which means usually the shape that I'm cutting or the component will stick inside the cutter now I prefer that I have a really I'm really good at getting them out I use the my little finger and I just tap it out so it just pops out if there's any fingerprints on there I just go over it with my finger and wipe them away now the reason I prefer this is it is a lot less work with sanding and cutting around the messy edges so what you'll see is that there isn't any messy edges I have very sharp high quality cutters as well and that makes a big difference so the key is with a slab is to cut as much as humanly possible out of that slab cut your pieces and components as close together as you can and then any tiny little gaps left make sure that you use it for studs or you could even use it for little tiny dangly I was going to say dangly bits, but that sounds terrible. Um, but as you can see, we're just going to cut out the slab. I'm just using some of my favorite shapes at the moment. And, you know, it changes all the time. Uh, the outline cutters are probably the sharpest cutters on the market. They are absolutely phenomenal. Uh, they're in line with Blue Beetle Co. as well, who I've collabed with, with my beautiful moth cutters. All of the cutters that I choose to use are high quality. So Blackbird and Violet, um, Clay Metal Studio, um, GF Art, Arc and Curve, Outline, Claytime Tools, um, and some Phoenix and Spruce as well. I just use like a whole variety of really, really sharp cutters. And these are my favorites. There are a lot of shape cutter makers out there. And so I am not at all limiting. I haven't tried every shape cutter out there. These are the ones that I know and love and that I recommend. I think that's the best way to put it really. Um, also, sometimes I use my blade just to scrape around those little finicky bits. And that saves me heaps of sanding later. If you're wondering why I'm doing that. Um, also, if a shape is really small and I can't get my finger in, then I will usually burnish the slab onto the tile to cut it out, or I will blow it out using my mouth. <laughs> Everyone does it. Don't pretend you don't. We all do it. So anyway, it's starting to look amazing. Now, when I'm doing this, I'm imagining the other components in the um, sprinkle slab. So it just gives me, I lay it out like this, and then I literally pick that tile up and bake it directly on the tile. Um, so yeah. Now, you'll notice as we go along in this, I change the components and I move it around, and that's just part of my process and what I do, but I usually have an idea of what I want. Uh, this has been the way that I've worked for a long, long time. And it just works for my process. Not everybody will work the same way, but I, I like this way of working. Now, those little dangly bits that I was getting there, I needed to burnish. So what I did is I put the baking paper over the slab and rubbed it down. I still found that they stuck in there, so I just blew them out. <laughs> oh my God, guys, dangly bits and blowing them out. Look, what is happening? This, this video is going rogue. <sighs> Anyway, you knew what I meant. 
<laughs> and so what I'm doing now is getting tiny little components like so those little mini studs that I'm going to actually end up using on that curved triangle component and it looks super cool now we're on to the black one and yeah it's pretty much self-explanatory of what's going to happen here now obviously the finishing of these is all going to happen in part two so what we're going to do i'm going to show you the end result on youtube but you won't see the end result if you're a patreon until the part two of the video so does that make sense because i have to film it to show the youtube anyway you know what i mean <laughs> Um, but this has been really fun sharing this part of the process with you. I hope that you love what you're seeing. Um, but yeah, I'm really, really happy with how they turned out. And I'm so excited to finish them off and share them in my Patreon. But yeah, so these are also going to probably get colored jump rings. I'm thinking of doing like lilac and possibly cobalt blue because that would look really sick. Or I might even use the acid yellow that I have, which um, looks amazing as well. Uh, the colored jump rings that I'm talking about are available on my website, as are the stainless steel rollers and my depth guides. So if you can't find them on my website or my website is closed for some reason, you can get all my tools from my amazing stockers who are Blackbird and Violet, Jewelry Supplies Co., and towards polymer clay they are all australian based suppliers right now um, i am working on some international so fingers crossed that will happen one day but yeah i am so excited for part two now part two is only going to be available on my patreon um, but it's super affordable it's only ten dollars a month if you want to jump in on that i think it's even less if you're in the uk uh, sorry if you're in the uk or the US so yeah come and be a part of my little community you'll get lots of make with me's and things like that I mean obviously my patreon community are watching it right now so sorry that you're hearing this <laughs> but you know I've got to like promo myself because otherwise who else is going to do it um but yeah so I will share the finished um earrings with the YouTube but patreon you guys will have to wait for part two so here they are just before they get cured, look how bright and beautiful they are. I waited until this morning, um, the next day, to take this picture because I wanted you to see it in natural light and they just look phenomenal. So thanks for hanging out with me. I've had so much fun. It's been a while. Sorry, it's a bit chitty chatty. Um, but yeah, I've really, really had fun. How good are these? <laughs>